in a nutshell, <clears throat> I was going to talk about what's the message that CR data has for evolutionary theory and what does evolutionary theory, what can it tell us uh, about how to extend life. And in the first direction, what, uh, what evolutionary theory has to learn from caloric restriction, it's basically that death is by design, that aging is a metabolic program under genetic control, and presumably it's there because it evolved as an adaptation. Um, and the, the basic argument for that is simply that the body can do so, much, so many things so much better while we're calorically restricted that it's very hard to understand why the body wouldn't be doing those things uh, with the resources of full feeding unless it really wanted to. That, that, that's going to be my... Um, message. And this is a radical theory, as I'll talk about later, for evolutionary theory, because evolutionary um, when you think of evolutionary adaptations, well, your circulatory system is an adaptation, you know, it has a purpose, it brings blood, uh, brings nutrients to your body, your um, respiratory system is an adaptation, your nervous system is an adaptation. All these things increase survival. They're, they have a clear fitness benefit. If aging has a fitness benefit, it can't accrue to the individual. Clearly, aging is only bad for individual fitness. You don't produce any more offspring for having died, just to, to restate the obvious. So if aging is an adaptation, it's it's one that um, evolutionary theory needs to expand to accommodate, and that's a lot of the work that, that I do. Um, the second thing that, it, the second direction, what does evolutionary theory have to tell us about uh, life extension? Uh, I'll state it succinctly. Natural is out, and high tech is in. Uh, so what do I mean? What, what's wrong with natural? Well, you know, we've heard so much about natural, it's become natural to us to think natural is good. But the argument for uh, natural is good goes back to evolution. You, th you imagine that the body functions best when you allow it to diet or perhaps the other uh, surrounding circumstances in which humans or our um, predecessors evolved. We are presumably well adapted to a certain diet and if you give us that diet then we function optimally. Well, that argument goes, so, goes only so far. It can probably prevent disease, it can probably prevent um, certain disorders in youth. If you imagine that um, the circulatory system is well ad is optimized to a certain diet, maybe the circulatory system will function best if you feed yourself a quote natural diet. But if aging is an adaptation, if aging is something that the body is doing it to itself, a, a time bomb that's deliberately implanted within us, all we do by eating a natural diet is to ensure that that time bomb goes off on schedule. So um, if we're going to tinker with aging, it's not going to be by eating natural foods or by giving ourselves a natural, uh, natural diet or a natural environment in any way. Conversely, on the other side, uh, it, it's tremendously good news for high-tech interventions. Why is that? Well, if you think of in the old way, in which people thought about aging, in which everybody thought about aging uh, 20, 30 years ago, in which still there were a lot of people, think of aging as an attrition, a wearing out. Our body's uh, systems just aren't as good in time because 
by analogy with uh, a car, the, the parts are wearing out. In order to come up with a, an intervention to counter that, you would have to have something to repair your eyesight and something to deal with your circulatory system, something to um, prevent Alzheimer's disease. For all the ways that the body deteriorates, and there are hundreds, you would have to have a separate chemical intervention. And that's just daunting. But if you imagine, which I, I believe to be the case, uh, again, you know, based on, on evolutionary theory, that aging is an adaptation under genetic control, there are hormonal signals that turn it on and off. We've seen this in CR, that there are hormonal signals that can turn the whole thing down with just a few, uh, presumably, we can hope, just a few chemical inputs. We have a, a basis for seeing that from the fact that single gene mutations can extend life dramatically, presumably by um, slowing the aging process for a whole lot of different systems at once. So these places are, are tremendously promising as targets for uh, chemical intervention and targets for new drugs. Uh, it, it's that sense in which I say high tech is in. Uh, I believe that coming to us in the, in the next years or perhaps decades are chemical invention, interventions that uh, work with exactly those uh, bottlenecks, those signal points that can control the entire aging process rather than dealing with the effects individually. So um, that, that was the summary. I'm going to now go back and, and ramble and talk about my experiences, how I came to believe what I believe, um, how I learned what, I, what I've learned, and um, why I believe what I believe. It, the, my background is a, a theoretical physicist. Um, I was ready for a career change in 1996 when I read uh, Dr. Weindrich's Scientific American article and didn't know it at the time, but it, that started me on a path. Um, it was the first time that I realized that caloric restriction was not just a trick that you can play on lab mice, but it was a generalized biological phenomenon o over many taxa. And I didn't know anything about uh, physiology and felt unqualified to think about it, but it, it was natural to me to think in terms of evolution. It seemed to me that if caloric restriction works so well over such a wide variety of animals, there must be a common evolutionary basis for it. There must be a simple simple reason why the caloric restriction adaptation is um, is adaptive and it must be so general that uh, it applies to animals as far